Well, welcome to our special night honoring women in comedy. Uh, Thank of you. course, Saturday Night Live. So please welcome, we certainly ready for UCSB Pollock Theater primetime player, Lorraine Newman. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we watched it. We're going to be watching a lot of uh, skits tonight. We watched a couple to get the audience warmed up. What was it like seeing skits, you know, 40 years later with a live audience again? Well, Matt, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's great. You know, um, it was exciting to work with Richard Pryor. I had actually met him when I was 14 because my sister <clears throat> was in New York and she was an MC at the Bitter End. So he was a friend of hers. So he came to LA to uh, perform at the Troubadour, if you can imagine that. And he was, you know, the 60s with the, I mean, yeah, with the skinny tie and the skinny lapels. And so I met him then. I was in like this brace that was so attractive. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then cut to, you know, when he's hosting the show. And I said, I I'm Tracy Newman's sister, do you remember? And he's like, oh, by the way, that's great. And um, actually, the Exorcist sketch was the only one that, at that point, had been written by someone who was not on our staff. It was written by Paul Mooney, uh, who was Richard's writer. And um, we kind of rehearsed it at this rehearsal hall where we had some of the auditions for SNL, uh, NOLA. And I mean, I could do that voice. I could, you know. Your mother sucks in <laughs> hell. <laughs> 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 but because Richard had to throttle me and I would have to be body mic'd, we couldn't do it, so I had to have Chevy dub it. But, um, you know, we were messing around and I was like, you know, <laughs> dog, you know, and everything, and making him laugh. I was making him laugh. It was so exciting. And then um, when I watch the sketch, it drives me crazy because I'm like so relaxed. My feet are just, you know, so relaxed. But um, yeah, and Puppy Uppers and Doggy Downers, we filmed <clears throat> before we actually went on the air. Mm -hmm. We filmed a lot of the uh, commercial parodies at that time. And it was when we were all kind of getting to know one another. Um, I remember we were having problems because the dogs kept, you know, pointing their anuses towards the camera. <laughs> and couldn't just, uh, so never work with dogs or kids, that's all I can say. <laughs> But yeah, that was really early on when we just were getting to know each other. Now, be honest, did you actually drug, you and Gil to drug your dogs? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course. No, actually, for, for some of our younger audience, in the time, the 70s, pill popping was a big thing going on in the 70s, especially with the parents' generation. I the wouldn't know. I, yeah, I don't know my mom and dad. So it was timely. Uh, let's go back to a little of your earlier days. Uh, I talked to my students about boosting their resumes. They need something to pad their resumes. Well, you were in Paris with learning uh, pantomime with Marceau Marceau. Yes. How did that prepare you for SNL and doing this Q&A tonight? N not at all. <laughs> um, I, uh, I fell in love with mime because I saw Marcel Marceau at Royce Hall when I was a teenager. And I went backstage and asked him if there was anybody in LA that taught mime. So he recommended this guy, Richmond Shepard, and so I started studying mime and improv at 16 uh, because he was teaching improv too. But it, you know, the only vestiges of mime for me, uh, whenever, because you do space work when you do uh, improv and sketches. If I like am holding you know, uh, a spoon or something or whatever, I'm so ingrained that you know, I'm holding it until I put it down. You know, I, I don't just, it doesn't just disappear from my hand. But um, there was no, really call, no real call for it on SNL. So um, the answer is no. <laughs> but yeah, I would just tell you, in the Richard Pryor skit, you're doing a lot of nonverbal things, and you're kind yeah, of, yeah. Yeah, and having and to affect it being you know, yeah. uh, moved around. Yes, I would have to say that, yes, impact. But it sounds like more of the influence was uh, you were part of the founders of the uh, you know, improv group, the Groundlings. Yes. So how did that help you prepare, you know, learning the improv? Well, that was exactly what, you know, it was like we were bred to do that kind of work because you did a sketch, you were on stage, uh, you know, at the Groundlings. Um, this was stuff that you wrote. You're on stage, you know, lights go out, you're done. You exit quickly, change quickly, come back in the dark, lights go up and you go. And that's exactly what SNL was. And many of us came from that kind of thing with Second City, although they didn't do costumes. 
Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, The Lampoon Show, which was also kind of a comedy review. Uh, Jane was from The Proposition, which was also an improv group. So we were all pretty much trained to do that kind of work. It did prepare us. Uh, but you also got an early gig working with uh, Lily Tomlin on her comedy special. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, that kind of... Well, that um, Lauren was producing this Lily Tomlin special, and they came to see the Groundlings because they needed to cast some men. And I was doing a bunch of characters, among them the Valley Girl, and Lily has this great character, Susie Sorority. <laughs> and um, so they cast me in that sketch. And they had, a, if you, I mean, I don't know how available the, the special is, but there are a lot of Groundlings in it. And um, Catherine Coleman was in it. I don't know if any of you know who she was. She was like a televangelist <laughs> who started her show, I Believe in Miracles. <laughs> and I can't even remember what she did on the show, but uh, Richard Dreyfuss was also on the show. And yeah, it was, uh, but I was 22 when I did that. And then Lauren uh, was hired to do SNL. He came back to the Groundlings. I was doing new material, new characters. And he asked me to meet him at the Chateau Marmont to discuss this show that was a cross between 60 Minutes and Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was actually, so Lauren and historically has gone to the Groundlings and other groups, yes. just even today, oh, looking yeah. for new talent because they know that you're properly trained. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, so what was your initial reaction when he pitched you this idea of 60 Minutes and well, uh, Monty Python? He said I would be in New York, and I thought, F <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to New York. Oh, I don't want to go to New York. And, um, but he said, it's just going to be for 13 weeks, I mean, with a five-year option. And I'm thinking, yeah, like, that'll never happen. You know, so I thought, why not? You know, I was, I was game. And it lasted a little bit longer than you, longer. <laughs> you thought. Uh, but in those days, there were a lot. There were variety shows. It wasn't uncommon. Yes. There was a lot. But this was kind of one of the first to skew to a younger audience to kind of go after a whole new demographic. Uh, how was it with all the other young comedians kind of tackling the social issues of the day? What, what do you mean? Other well, like all the other comedians, you you know, you had younger comedians. You had the George Burns. You had a lot of older sketch comedy. But now you were all young. A whole new wave of comedy coming up. Well, it was thrilling in the sense that, you know, we were, we were writing and, and producing things that made us laugh, but it was reflective of the culture that we grew up in, and we never saw that kind of content on TV before. And because we were a late night show, and NBC really didn't know what to make of us, you know, we had kind of all of their furniture, you know, <laughs> and uh, we didn't really know if anybody was watching us. We just, you know, were excited by the fact that, you know, we could do sketches about rolling a joint and, and then thinking that you would inject it and stuff like that. And, you know, all that kind of content, a reflection of the kind of TV that we watched when we were growing up, parodies of the Twilight Zone. I mean, you just, you know, and then you've got like Michael O'Donohue's National Lampoon sensibility, where, you know, the very first sketch of the very first show is, I'd like to feed your fingertips to the Wolverines. I mean, that's, you know, um, stuff that made us laugh, but you never saw that on Laugh-In. Right. And then also, you, especially in the early days, you had a lot of guest hosts that had real comic experience. Michael yeah. Palin's. He, I think he hosted like four times in the first I year know. or something. Yeah. Uh, so how was that for you, having like the Monty Python group kind of There were so many, so many people that hosted the show that were like, oh my god, I can't believe it. Um, but it was the musicians that really got to me. I mean, David Bowie and, uh, you know, George Harrison, people like that. Uh, but then, yeah, you know, Kirk Douglas and Broderick Crawford from Highway <laughs> Patrol, you know. It was, it, what, that was what was so great about um, the years that we did it, because we would break new, new bands that nobody had ever seen before. You know, and um, we would have hosts that were not necessarily didn't, you know, when they weren't promoting a movie like now. Right. But um, the the against type positioning of them on a show like ours was just gold. You know, I mean, Burt Reynolds, Strother Martin. You know, it was just it was a really great combo. 
Yeah, one of my all-time favorite comics. We're going to show a clip a little later about Newhart. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How many watched the Newhart show? The first one. Not <laughs> 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 Larry David. great shows. He was. Uh... Now you did do impressions of celebrities. Uh, one in particular, Barbara Streisand. We talk yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really, I was so, I was the only person that could really carry a tune. I swear to God. And you know, I had the honker. So, but. Um, I really didn't know anything about Barbara Streisand. I knew who she was. I'd seen her in Funny Girl, but you know, it wasn't the kind of music I listened to. But everybody else on the staff, you know, Paul Schaefer and Marilyn Miller, were instructing me on her mannerisms right before I went on because I didn't know. So it was really uh, learning on your feet. <clears throat> but retroactively, now you're kind of like, oh my God, I did Barbara Streisand. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> it was a privilege to do her material, to do Marilyn's material because she's such a great writer. Yeah, so what was the general relationship with the writers on the show? How did that kind of work well, with you and the cast? We loved yeah. the writers. We owed them everything, and we knew that. And you know, there were people like Danny, who was definitely a writer, Dan Aykroyd, <clears throat> and Gilda, who definitely wrote with Alan Zweibel. Um, but I mean, I could recognize people like Jim Downey and uh, Tom and Max, uh, Tom uh, Gamble and Max Pross, who went on to write The Simpsons and Seinfeld. You know, they were just these kids out of Harvard, and, but their p POV was so unique. You know, um, <clears throat> I think one of the first things I saw them that I was in that they wrote was a, a thing about a family living near a toxic, uh, a nuclear <laughs> toxic waste dump, you know, and everybody coming in so tired and, oh, my hair, gee, you know, it's like and moving your arm. Oh, I broke my arm, you know, stuff like that. It was just so tasty and so unique. Uh, now, the show is an ensemble, of course, I mean, yeah. more than any, anything, and especially in that day, they were just all together. The cast was just one. Um, so we might time to take a look at a skit. It happens to be a good promo for the new Avengers movie. It's oh, called yes. The Superhero's Dinner, if you can set yeah, her up. Yeah, um, Margot Kidder, who was the star of the Superman movie at the time, playing Lois Lane, was our host. And <clears throat> it's funny, when I saw this thing again, I thought, how? It was because, you know, you Marvel Comics and DC Comics and all that content is so ubiquitous now. For some reason, when I was watching it, I thought, how do we know to do that stuff, you know? And uh, you'll see that the, the costumes are magnificent and the jokes are just great. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so just, oh, oh sorry. Uh, so how does this get like that work? How do you put that together on the old show? Um, I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. I mean, well, is it something like each cat, each actress? You know, what I can do Hulk, or I can do you know, oh, or, or oh. this voice, or um, yeah, I, I imagine that the actors, uh, the writers, might might have gone around and polled the actors to see what they can do. But you know, a lot of times, what was so exciting about the show is that uh, you were kind of thrust into a position to do something that you didn't know you could do, and that's exciting. And I also was amazed, we talked a little before the show, Margot Kidder, which we're actually going to see another skit soon, um, she was really good. She had the timing. She couldn't oh, tell yeah. she was reading cue cards. Did, did, how often did that happen when you had, I mean, I know the comics, you know, Richard Pryor, but when you had a guest host, how often did that kind of surprise them? Wow, well, these people. Well, cue cards are difficult. They're, they're difficult for anybody. Um, I'm trying to think if, if I can even think of anybody who was particularly good at them. You know, it's, it's really something you learn over time. Uh, it's, it's hard to watch earlier episodes and see yourself reading, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it really is. So I, I can't really think of any host that was particularly bad or good at it. But she seemed to have a special timing thing yes, with you guys. Yes, she was terrific. And, she was you know, very that's good. It's a 10 minute skit that she had to kind of also carry in a lot of ways yeah. for dealing with Bill. Um, so speaking of individual styles, we're going to do another skit you, you did preview before, The Dating Game. Oh, yes. Yeah, with Jane Gilder, Bob Newhart, and Bill Murray. Uh, so can you give us a little prep for um, I really wanted you to show this one because Jane, you know, because of her all-American beauty, was often just given very straight roles, even though she managed to be funny in those. This is an example of the true gallows humor that Jane had. And it's a character that she never got to do before or since, but really 
it makes me laugh so much, and I hope you appreciate it as much as I do. Oh boy. <laughs> well, let's talk a little about Jane. Yeah. Jane Curtin. Um, so what, what do you look, what, when you look at that, what do you see? What do you see in her, you know, with it's her? Just, it's a character, I wish she had been able to do more of those kind of characters. I mean, how great was that? Yeah. How hilarious, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I just, uh, and I don't remember that one very well, I just remember Jane, you know? Uh, so yeah, I just wish she could have done more characters like that. Because they had a tendency, I mean, they put her on Weekend Update. They had a tendency yes. to have her play kind of that straight kind of... Right, right. Uh, did, she ever, did she ever like lobby, I want to be able to do more characters? Or? She, she was very pragmatic and, you know, really couldn't give a shit. She, <laughs> she loved doing the work, but when she was done, she went home. You know, Gilda and I stayed and, and worked with the writers, but Jane just went home to her husband. God bless her. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gilda, I mean, she did a lot of great characters, Roseanne, Rosanna Dana. What was, what was special about her? What'd she bring to the ensemble that was unique? Well, she was someone who, uh, whose personality was so endearing, and that's really who she was. She was really a very good person and a very generous and affectionate person. And on top of that, she could do characters. And it, you know, what was also great about the show is that you know, these characters no one had ever seen before. Some of us brought characters from you know, the various companies that we came from. I brought some. But you know, we're also given characters that we've never done before, that no one's ever seen before. And she really you know, just put them on really very, very well. You know? And uh, we were talking a little earlier, like a lot of the older sketch comedy shows, I mean, you, had, you were pushing boundaries sexually, too. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. Jane, what she was saying, what you were saying. There's also another skit, which won't be able to watch, Snake Handlers, where you're playing with snakes oh, the yes. whole time. So what was that like when they pitched these ideas? Let's do a snake handler or well, you're a dominant. Well, it, it was apropos of the host. Uh, we did snake handlers when Norman Lear was our host because it was the ultimate sitcom. It had every kind of aspect of a socially conscious sitcom, you know, um, and you'll hear in the theme song, you know, and Junior is gay, you know, uh, I'm a nun, I'm trying to remember uh, what the other things are in the sketch besides me. But, um, you know, this was our religion, that we were snake handlers. So, yeah. And that, they were live snakes. They were live snakes, yeah. How would you, how did you handle that? I, I grew up, you know, up in the chaparral on Kenter Canyon in LA, just <laughs> catching frogs and snakes and lizards, so I didn't have a problem. But uh, in rehearsal, there was, and they were defanged, but still, like the, the cavity where the fang came from was sharp. And I remember, you know how when you're having a trauma, things kind of slow down? And um, the snake was like hovering, and John was like, holy sh this thing is gonna bite me, and it did, you know. And John came close to fainting, oh, but didn't quite. <laughs> uh, can I go back to dating though? One of the things, the timing, the comic timing between you and the guest host, Bob Newhart. He was, was great. Yeah, you know, was that something that you know you in rehearsal you just knew he could do it because he was so such a straight guy. He was playing perfect. against you and Jane and Gilda. Yeah, he was absolutely great in that, and you know the material of course was fantastic, but it really, you know, this is a real uh, tribute to the writer's ability to really write something that was perfect for the host. You know, he couldn't be the, you know, he had to be the least likely guy who would want to be in that position. His persona, Bob Newhart, was just basically this guy who was put upon, you know, and that's what that was. And the writers knew how much they can push you guys to balance that. Oh, yeah. You know, how far they can stretch you and... God, anything goes with us. <laughs> you know. Well, uh, speaking of sex, uh, <laughs> we're going to move to another skit, which is, you, you mentioned one of your favorites of your colleague, Dan Aykroyd. Oh, okay. uh, with Margot Kidder named Fred Garvin, my old job, uh, <laughs> before the Pollock. So if you want to set that up, because well, it's... Well, um, at the time, Danny was uh, dating Rosie Schuster, who was one of our writers, a really beautiful girl. She was uh, one of the superheroes that, whose face you couldn't see, but what a body! <laughs> and um, this was kind of a character that he did when they were together that made her laugh really hard, and so she wrote this sketch. And what's great about it is that, you know, he is a male prostitute, and, but Danny's take on it is that he is a journeyman. 
male <laughs> prostitute, that this is a blue collar job. And uh, he's very, uh, you know, he's good at what he does. Um, and please enjoy it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how Margot Kidder did not break character. I don't either. <laughs> you know, I think that they were friends before the show. They knew one another from Canada. Oh, that, that doesn't help. Um, well, let's talk a little about Dan. What, what was special about Dan? Because by nature, he's also a writer. He had a lot of other things for uh, Danny him. is a genius. That's all, you know, it's quite simple. He is a genius. His characters were so unique. You know, his approach, his point of view, the kind of things that he wrote. Um, I was always really dazzled by his talent. Really appreciated it. Uh, and how fun was it you? Years later, you did it according to Jim episode. Oh, yeah. with, how was it going back to Dan? Twenty. We did an, a story arc, three episodes. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was great. I was basically he played a cop and I played his girlfriend, and I thought, how funny would it be if I sounded just like him? So <laughs> basically, my character just is you know basically kind of like this. Uh, hello, citizen, and. Um, they, of course, think I'm gay, but I'm not. And I don't, I don't know why everybody thinks that. You know, it's, uh, it was a great one. Uh, and also, you, you reunited with him and the others in the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night yes. Live. Oh my How special God. was that evening to get back with Jane and Dan and Bill and everybody? That was, uh, <clears throat> it was a really great <clears throat> love fest. And I'm, I'm not kidding. It really, uh, it's like, I don't know if, any of you are old enough to have gone to your 40th high school reunion, but you know, like the 10 year, <laughs> the 10 year, everybody still got their grudges and everything, and you know, they don't quite know who they are. But by the 40th, you're just glad to be alive. <laughs> and you know, um, most of us, you know, we're old enough to where few of us have our parents living. And I've said this quite often, but it's really true. Um, and it was true for people who had been hosts and who were people who were like just part of the scene. I don't think like at the time we did the show, Jim Carrey was never host, he was still developing. Mm. But it's like, you know, all of these people were there and it's, we've all borne witness to each other's youth. And that's very special, it makes it, it was a familial thing to begin with, but this particular event was even more so. And it was just, everybody was so genuinely happy to see one another. It was, it was wonderful. It's also sort of a Groundlings reunion because Groundlings has basically created most Saturday Night Live characters, it seems like, for cast members. Yeah, I, um, I love that a lot of the Groundlings are in casts because, you know, it, uh, it's a certain sensibility and I've watched some of these people develop because I go see Groundlings shows all the time and then to see them go on the show and just thrive is so exciting. Um, I, um, when I heard that they were going to do a 40th anniversary show, I had always wanted to be in the Californians. I always felt like the Valley Girl <laughs> would be a perfect matriarch for the soap opera, you know. So I called Lauren. I said, I don't know if you're going to do sketches and, you know, I don't know if you'll like this idea, but I think it'd be really funny if Sherry, you know, was in the Californians as like the family matriarch. And I, I thought, no, nah, nothing will come of this. And then uh, um, Fred Armisen, emailed me and he said, let's write it. <laughs> so we spent some time writing in my kitchen. They used none of what we wrote, but it was really fun. And I was so excited to be in that sketch. <laughs> well, we're, we're gonna actually showcase uh, Bill Murray. Uh, some people know him from the movie Garfield. I'm not sure he's done anything else since. Uh, <laughs> so, but it also is one of your iconic characters. Uh, Coneheads. Oh, okay. The Family Feud Coneheads. So how did that come about and you get into our... Um, well, game shows are really the lifeblood. I mean, they still, I don't know if what, anybody watched last week's show, but Black Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, how great was that? You know, and uh, it's really edgy humor. It's a really a good chance to do that kind of edgy stuff. And um, speaking of improvising, you know, I improvised a moment in that where, I don't know if this is the one though, it might have been the one with Steve Martin. Well, we will see. I think, let's take a look. Okay. Did you know the Coneheads would be such a recurring, ongoing like, love characters? You know, it's, it's very gratifying when something you find funny that you don't know necessarily anybody else is gonna find funny does. You know, and could, could I know? No. Could I know the show was gonna be that long living? 
No, couldn't know that. And Bill Murray, it seems like they, they began to cast him a lot as the lounge singer, game show host. Uh, what was it about Bill that thought, oh, he's perfect for that? Yeah. Well, he, he really, you know, like Richard Dawson was so slimy and gross. It was always like really inappropriate with the women contestants, you know. So he really got that kind of smarmy thing. And then, you know, all the Knicks. As a lounge singer, you know, he's, uh, he gets that kind of sleazy guy. He gets it. <laughs> Did you see? Uh, did you see his future when he, when you first? Did you see the career he was going to have? Like, wow, there's something about Bill that he's gonna take. I I, um, I don't know that I could necessarily see his future, but I felt that he was incredibly strong, and that he had something that nobody else had, and that he was good looking. So you know, it was the same with Chevy. I mean, you could pretty much see that he would have a a movie career. Um, but Billy, you know, there was just nobody like him, and I had never, and I'd seen a lot of great people. Even at, at that age, I'd, I'd seen a lot, and I had never seen anybody like him. It also seems that they had you making out with him on that skit, Micro Dentist, if you get a look, Kirk Douglas. Seems to be that you well, got... Well, that, that I just did in, this, in the moment. I, uh, <laughs> that wasn't planned, um, and... Uh, so that's, that doesn't count. <laughs> but Bill rolled with it great. He did. <laughs> you know, he really he did. didn't break for a second. No. He kind of, uh, so but our, we're going to view our last cast member before we move on to the next part of the show, John Belushi. Mm -hmm. uh, a classic skit uh, called The Godfather. <laughs> uh, future Sopranos. Like There's some seeds you see of a lot of future stuff. Does anything you want to intro? Or are we? Um, well, the monologue I do in this was uh, the monologue that I did in The Groundlings. It's just straight on from there. And um, I think it was the first show that Elliot Gould hosted. I'm not sure. But um, I just love, love the whole premise of a, you know, group therapy. I thought it was a rich vein to mine. <laughs> <laughs> do you still remember that speech? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's also in this book, Titters, which is a compilation of women's humor. Uh, oh, no, that's actually something else I wrote. Never mind. Um, yeah, I remember it very well, because ugh, I wrote it. I don't know. You know, uh, that's the one that's shown more often, so it's easy to remember it. Ah. And what was special about John working? What, what kind of, what was most unique about him? He was really sweet. You know, he had this very edgy side to him, no, no denying that. Um, but he was really very sweet, Midwestern guy with kind of good manners. And, you know, he was married and uh, kind of his existence was very, on the outside, very straight. But, you know, he had cer certain, you know, aspects that were troubling. But he was generous with you, the other cast oh, members. Oh, he was and, very, yeah. and he, you know, this whole thing about him not liking women's humor or not thinking women were funny is totally false. He, he you know, loved Gilda. He, she made him laugh all the time. He, he got Jane, he got me. You know, it's just not true. Um, so, did you, I mean, you heard we have some students in the audience, my interns. How is it, did you ever dream that your skits would still resonate 40 years later? I mean, the, Do they? Well, you heard our audience, they were, uh, they were going nuts. I, uh, that's, that's really great. I mean, you know, if stuff can have a, I think that young people are very sophisticated anyway, and because there's so much media and so much uh, choice about you know, different forms of comedy that have never existed before. Mm -hmm. I think that it gives them a starting point to where they're calibrated to understand something that might not have been relevant, you know, that might not be relevant to them now, but they get it you know, because they're so sophisticated. So I'm glad they dig it. It's also something that's more for comedy today that you just have to be on your A game as a writer today or a comedian today, because of the YouTube generation, all this stuff that they're not gonna waste their time unless you know you deliver. Yeah, you have to be original. Yeah. You have to offer something that nobody's seen before. Okay, so let's talk a little post-career. For you, you uh, jumped into a different medium, yes. animation. Yes. Uh, so let's talk about well, what we'll we're gonna show a little scissor reel to show some different voices and talk a little about that. Do you have any intro, what do you wanna do? Um, 
Well, I, I just want to say that I, this is my favorite thing that I do, and it was really everything I've learned and, and done in my life has led up to this. I found my home. Um, I did audition for two years solid before I got um, a series. And after that, you know, it's a hard thing to break into, but once you do, you never stop working. And I, I just, I love that. I've gotten to work with Rob Zombie and Guillermo del Toro, and it's just been, you know, I've met a lot of my comedy idols, and it's, it's a really great, it's a great career. How is it different transitioning? Because you've performed live audiences, live audience, now into animation. How has that process changed from one medium to? Well, um, it's funny, you know, you, people think that you don't use your body when you do animation, but you do. Um, but I have found that when I go from animation to on camera, I've forgotten how to use my body and my face in that way to integrate it. Oh. Um, but, you know, most of the shows I've done, I've been lucky enough to where we do them uh, like a play. They don't record us individually like most shows, uh, which is a, it's like doing a play, and it's so fun. And how much, I mean, obviously you do a lot of different character voices, so how did you know, all your improv work and building those characters help you transition to animation? Well, I think that when you audition for a cartoon, they'll, sh they'll give you a description of the character, and you'll see a picture of the character, and that usually, you know, you have a couple of minutes to figure it out, especially if you're <clears throat> looping um, like a feature, you know, the, the thing I did in Monsters, Inc., you know, that I just had that day to figure it out. And um, it happens with a lot of uh, the Illumination and Pixar things where, you know, they have general looping groups that fill in the crowd voices, and then they'll have a smaller group, like of four people. And I'm lucky enough to be in that group where, you know, they have certain characters that need to be filled in, but you see the drawing that day, and then you just kind of go from there. And you never know if it's going to be you or the other person, you know, who tries it out. But um, it's, you know, the improv does help with that, you know, having that, uh, that facility to uh, take the little cues that you've got, the little bit of information, and then take it in a direction that you want to take it. And nine times out of 10, that's what they want, because they don't quite know what they want. Uh -huh. And so if you bring them something that <clears throat> is really, you know, idiosyncratic to you, it sometimes can really work well. Now you've also gone to HBO on two occasions. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about the first one, we're gonna step up a clip for the second one. Uh, Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> that, that audition was the uh, you know, audition for an improvised show. Uh, I was, this was the um, incest survivor support group. <laughs> I was told that I would be reading for the moderator of the, of the group. I, didn't, I was not told I'd be reading for a, um, an incest survivor. So, um, oh, I just made up some <laughs> and, and they liked it, so. And the episode, if I'm thinking, job. Larry David crashed the group because he had to. Yeah, he, well, he had this girl that he really liked. <laughs> But he knew that he could not be in the group unless he qualified. <laughs> so he made up this story about his, you know, uncle who's an osteopath abusing him. And then, I don't know if you guys have seen the episode, so we're not showing it. Are no, we? no, no, we can't. Okay. Get that. So I mean, then um, his wife does a play, and I'm the director, and his uncle comes backstage, and I'm introduced to him, and freak out on him. You beast! You asshole! You piece of shit! You know. <laughs> But HBO is actually an interesting place because you can push the boundaries. Yeah. But that's not going on network TV. No. <laughs> no. Uh, Although, you know, it's funny. I mean, when I watch SNL now, clearly they're saying f <laughs> and they're just bleeping yeah. it out, you know. But you see the, you know, just the whole thing around the, the and it's, I think a lot of things have kind of gone by the wayside, which is good. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, that we didn't, we're not able to show it today, but there's a skit that Lorraine was in called Floggin' Mistrels. Oh, God. Uh, and basically, they say the word floggin' well, 150 times It's based in on place. the infamous Trogs tape. There was a band, an English band called the Trogs. They had a hit with Wild Thing, and then someone did one of those underground recordings of their next attempt at, at doing their album, and they are just having the worst time, it's like, well, why don't you play the bass line the way you play it the other day, you know, and <laughs> that they're just bickering, it's so ugly, 
And so, you know, Paul Schaefer was always really into that kind of stuff, you know, like the Orson Welles snow peas thing and <laughs> all of that stuff. So um, they came up with this thing of the medieval uh, musicians trying to compose a, um, a song for the Queen of Accutane, played by John Belushi. <laughs> uh, and by this time, he and uh, Danny, had, or not Danny, he and, uh, yeah, I think he and Danny had left the show, so they came back to do this. And um, at one point, you know, we'd replaced the word f with flogging, and on the air, Paul Schaefer accidentally <laughs> said, <laughs> and I was a page in the, in the sketch, but I had enough time to go into the booth to see what was going on, and it was like an oil painting. <laughs> Everybody was frozen to the console. And then when John came on, you know, he was the queen of Accutane with a fan, and just like, well, I don't know how you could have done that, you know? And she's like wrapping Paul Schaefer with the fan, you know? It was great. I loved that. Well, right now in the booth, they're doing the same thing because we both cursed tonight. Oh, yeah. We're not live TV, so we can leave it out. But uh, one problem sometimes, TV shows run way too long. Yes. It's a big problem. Uh, Girls is going into a 38th season with you. So why don't we take a quick look what the HBO did, 38th season of Girls uh, with Lorraine Newman. Okay. <laughs> So what, 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 how did that come about? Like, how did that... Um, Phil Lamar, who is a voiceover actor and an actor and uh, a groundling, uh, went to college with Gail Lerner, who wrote this and directed it. And so um, he, she said to him, I want Lorraine Newman to play Lena, which, you know, first of all, I never want to be the lead, I swear to God. I just want to do my little thing. I don't like the responsibility. Just do my little thing and leave. But she really, you know, I said, can I play Shoshona? I'd really, I'd love to play that part. I think I could do good in that. She said, no, I want you to play uh, Hannah. So, and then she said, my dream cast would be uh, Mindy Sterling and Wendy Malick. And I said, well, <laughs> I happen to know them. <laughs> and, you know, the script was so good that, of course, they wanted to do it. So any tips we should ask Mindy about on Tuesday when she's here or something? Uh, um, you know, she uh, does one of the most difficult improvised shows that we do at the Groundlings mm -hmm. called Cooking with Gas. And um, it's a guest alumni and someone from the Sunday company and then someone from people from the main company. So it's, there's no show really like that at the Groundlings. And it's tough. I mean, it's... It's a level of improv that is so difficult that I get nervous watching it. And she is so great in it. Just fantastic. Cool. Well, we are uh, coming to our last skit of the night. Uh, we're going to go back to your roots. I understand you were interested in a counterculture beatniks uh, little this, flavor. This sketch is one of my favorite all-time SNL sketches, uh, complete ensemble. Um, sketch, uh, Michael O'Donohue, Tom Schiller, and I think a few other people wrote it. And, um, you know, there are young people in the audience, I don't think that they would know who someone like Lenny Bruce was, but he was like labeled a sick comic, and <laughs> <laughs> he, um, you know, uh, you'll see tasty little things on it, and it like, you know, him telling jokes that only the band gets, you know, <laughs> and um, it, it, I, I just, I want you to see it, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Yeah, Garrett Morris was amazing. That special thing. What was he? What was his special thing he, you brought to the team? Well, he was an actor, and he was a singer, and he was originally hired as a writer, um, as as was Chevy. They were not in the cast, and then you know, as things kind of evolved before we actually went on the air, they became cast members. So Lauren just saw something special in both. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. actually, Garrett was the most professional and experienced person in the cast. He had been in a movie. He was in Cooley High, you know, <laughs> and uh, he was, he's so talented. I mean, we did, we had, the cast was inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame, and Garrett did a speech that was so hilarious. You know, he's 80 years old, which I was shocked, but, um, you know, Garrett's never stopped working. He's always had his really great career with Jamie Foxx and, you know, um, Jamie Foxx's show and Two Broke Girls, and he just never stops working. 
And, uh, and Steve Martin was kind of oh. like a semi-cast member for you guys yeah. because he was on all the time, even on it. So yeah. what, was, what, why, why, what was special about him, why they kept, you know? Well, when we first a, heard he was going to be uh, <coughs> hosting the show for the first time, <coughs> people were complaining because, <coughs> sorry, uh, he was a stand-up, you know, and people were just saying, like, you know, well, they work alone, you know, they're not going to really, like, share the stage. Well, wrong. You know, they can't do characters. Well, they can, you know. So he, you know, from the stand-up world, they do work alone, you know, and it is hard for some stand-ups to really adjust to sketch playing, but boy, Steve just really took to it. So, uh, well, curious, says we're, we're doing women in comedy series and you're on the kickoff. What do you think has changed for women entering the field today in comedy than when you entered the field? Well, the fact that there's 50,000 outlets for it, but at the same time, you know, shows like Drunk History and, um, you know, Workaholics, a lot of shows that um, people can create under their own power, you know, and if it gets enough followers and enough viewers, they're holding all the cards, and that's a wonderful thing. And because there's so much content, only the really good stuff kind of rises to the top. Uh, there's so many different genres too, but I think that um, alternative comedy especially has more of a, I know how this sounds, but it has more of a mainstream exposure, you know, mm. and it becomes mainstream. And I think that that changes the whole uh, conversation of what's funny. So if there's like, if I'm 18 years old in the audience, what advice do you have for her to break in? Like what, do you, what should you do first to get, you know, Read a book. <laughs> um, have a compendium that you can draw from. Have an original point of view that nobody has seen before. See everything. See everything that's out there so that you don't do that again. Um, and just participate. You know, uh, be out there. And um, curious, what communities inspired you? When you were young? When I was, uh, well, um, yeah, when, you're when I was a teenager, I, I always loved comedy, starting with like uh, Eve Arden in Armis Brooks. I, I just, just thought she was the greatest. And um, Merv Griffin's show came, uh, it was on in New York, but it was on at 5.30 in the afternoon here in LA. And all the stand-ups that I saw on that show were just amazing. Um, David Fry, Pete Barbeauty, Corbett Monica, Sandy Barron, Richard Pryor, Jackie Leonard, Jackie Vernon. I mean, just, you know, this was a really great education. And then um, Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn's character work to me was just the pinnacle. I mean, her, her point of view was so unique and uh, of all the character actresses that did characters, she was my favorite and she was a you know, I'd say in terms of my performance style, Eve Arden and Madeline Kahn were my biggest influences. Uh -huh. What any comedians, uh, women comedians today inspire you? you, know, you know. Maria Bamford, um, Emily Heller, uh, April Richardson, oh God, Jackie, Jackie Cation. Oh my God, there's so many that are so good and I know I'm gonna be bolting up in bed at three in the morning, so why didn't I think of that, you know? But um, there's just so many, well, Amy Schumer, I love Amy Schumer. I love um, Sarah Silverman, love her. When I first saw uh, Jesus is Magic, it was like, oh my God, you know, this was a voice that was really fresh and I, I just related to her content so much and just rejoice at uh, her success as well. I feel Saturday Night Live cast was such an inspiration to audience members, comedians, actors, and even myself. I was only seven when I watched the premiere. I should not have stayed up that night. But I watched it from the beginning. So I know along with me and all the others in the audience tonight, you've all inspired us. And thank oh, you for thank paving you. the way for future comedians and kicking off our series. Thank you.